want other before, somebody has a before class? Yeah, yeah like a rant about having before class jokes to the before class. A rant for a joke. <laughs> it's getting too meta. Oh, wow. sorry. Does somebody have a joke? No, I'm just saying we should turn it on early just to catch those moments before just class, those golden moments, you know. Yes, well. And so this is one of those golden moments. Yeah. Now. I printed something. Hold on. <laughs> See, you got it. You just done it. <laughs> All right. How did that settle? <laughs> okay, I guess we can start. I guess we can start at this <laughs> All right, now I've tacked up uh, today's lecture. I'm not going to do this all the time because it's um, impossible for me to do it. But this time I did. Um, on the other hand, in class, I'm going to fill in uh, some of the gaps. I think there'll be, there are a few gaps here, and uh, so I'll fill those in. I'm a little concerned that the attendance has all of a sudden fallen off, um, presumably because homework was due. Um, <laughs> I, as, as you know, however, the People who don't do the homework are going to get an A minus. <laughs> this is there's no need to fear the homework. Um, also, the second problem may have been um, too difficult. Um, Just uh, a little bit too messy, at least. Um, in any event, let me go on with the lecture and. Um, so I'm going to pick up where we left off last time, and um, then, so let me just remind you of what we found. What we found was that the mean value of the Euclidean time order product Fields is in a, in a system described by a stationary density operator rho, which is trace of rho times uh, the time order product of this thing. This thing is now that rho is actually trace e to the minus beta h, and again time order by e x one from a x two, and now we have to divide by trace e to the minus beta h, and we had this. To we found that this was a path integral phi x1, phi x2, e to the minus integral 0 to beta, the energy density of the Hamiltonian d cubed x dt, and all that d phi divided by the same thing, phi zero to phi zero, uh, e to the minus, integral zero to beta, integral h of phi. Oh, let me just write this. All right, d cubed x dt dv. And here, because of the trace, we're integrating over periodic functions, that is to say the function is phi zero of x at inverse temperature zero and phi zero of x again at inverse temperature beta. That's how we implemented the trace. And now we're imagining uh, letting beta go to infinity and then this e to the minus beta h becomes proportional to 
projection operator on the ground state, well, literally times e to the minus beta e0. But the e to the minus beta e0 cancels in this ratio. And so what we have then is that, that in the ground state of theory, the Euclidean time order product, and now I'm generalizing by E of x1 by E of xn. Um, is a ratio of path integrals phi e x1 phi e x n e to the minus integral now the energy density over all of space time divided by integral e to the minus integral energy density over all of space time and um, I guess once again they're they're actually periodic uh, in time. So that's that's um, these are the basic relations, and these are the relations that a lot of quantum statistical mechanics and Euclidean quantum field theory are are, are based on. Um, In fact, I was toying with the idea of doing a few more manipulations, writing down some uh, formula involving variation derivatives and saying, well, that's the end of the physics, goodbye. And, um, but, uh, of course, I don't know how to do that. Um, all right, now, I want to make the notation simple, so I'm going to consider um, H, or rather, the Hamiltonian to be simply uh, H0, which is a, a quadratic Hamiltonian, a half pi of x squared uh, plus grad pi squared plus m squared pi squared p cubed. So let's let's look at this Hamiltonian for the, to, to begin with, and this will make the notation simpler, and so we can have a Euclidean action S0 apply then is going to be an integral of a half by dot squared plus grad pi squared plus m squared pi squared d fourth x. So that's the sort of thing that occurs up here. But now, um, these are space derivatives, these are time derivatives, so a simple way of writing it is just dA of phi squared plus m squared phi squared d4 of x. And you see this dA squared, this is why the thing is called, why the, this area of physics is called Euclidean quantum field theory. Namely that where that all the derivatives are occurring at the same sign, and this is characteristic of energy as opposed to action. All right, now we integrate by parts, and we get 1 half phi of x minus dA squared plus m squared phi of x d4 of x, and we throw away the surface terms. Um, why do we throw away the surface terms? Oh. Um, I don't know. We always do, and we wouldn't know what to do with them if we kept them. But um, let's say uh, I think it's that if they were non-zero in the limit, say t going to infinity, that would mean that there'd be an infinite amount of energy there, and uh, the thing would be damped out and not contribute. So let's, I'm not going to fret about this. I haven't, I haven't thought a great deal. I 
about this this time, so let me just say we're everybody drops these terms and I am too. All right, now now whenever you have something that only involves derivatives and constants and fields, the thing to do is to use a Fourier transform. And so I'm going to define this Fourier transform phi tilde P integral e to the minus i px phi of x d four x. And this px here is uh, we can say p zero x zero plus p dot x. So this is a Euclidean a Euclidean metric. So it's the energy times the time plus uh, the momentum dotted to the position, everything with a plus sign. That's one of the nice things about Euclidean space, you don't have this nonsense, uh, this, this indefinite metric which, in which you always have to think, what is the notation of this author? Is he using the space minus space squared minus time squared or time squared minus space squared? Anyway. So this is uh, phi, so the P and of course phi of x then is e to the i p x phi tilde of p and I'm putting the two pi's on the p integrations. Okay, now if you remember when you studied Fourier transforms, you know that if phi is real, then phi tilde of p is going to be e to the i p x phi of x d4 of x, right? I've just complex conjugated this. But by this definition, that's phi tilde of minus p. This is one famous Fourier relation. I'm sure Fourier realizes day one of his work on Fourier transform. Maybe not, but certainly by day n, or n is a small integer. By the way, um, if I'm talking quickly, that doesn't mean that you don't have a right to ask questions. You always have a right to ask questions, and I have brought the chocolate as usual. So, Feel free to ask a question at any time. What is the the index in there? It's I'll give you the choice. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, then on the third line, the third line down, the last line on the board, the one, the, the last line that you just wrote. Here. Yeah. On the first. Phi tilde of minus p. Yeah, but phi tilde, what is that in the parentheses right next to the phi tilde on the Oh, wait a second, I screwed up. I forgot to put a complex conjugation here. Okay, that's what I was asking. It yeah, so that flipped this sign, didn't do anything to phi because it's real, and that gave phi, gave, gives us phi tilde minus. Thank you, that was, this kind is worth two. Oh boy, thank you. Ordinary questions get one. Questions that reveal mistakes I've made are, worth two chocolates. I'm going to have to go to custom and buy some more things. All right, so, so let's uh, substitute this expression for phi in here. Well, what happens? Well, the minus d by dA squared comes in and hits this exponential and pulls down an IP and then pulls down another IP, and that means minus P squared. And so the result then is that S0 of C is equal to a half an integral phi tilde of P absolute value squared P squared plus M squared D4 P over 2 pi to 4 which is positive, or at least non-negative. In fact, it has to be positive, unless we're being very silly. Um, 
Now, I've, I've, I've skipped a few steps. Do you want me to put them in? I mean, I'm happy to. Oh, OK, so I'll put them in. Um, let's start with this over here. So this would be that this is actually an integral of a half. Now, phi of x is an integral e to the i p x tilde of p d4 p over 2 pi to the 4. And then we have minus da squared of n squared. And then an integral d e to the i p prime x uh, by tilde of p prime d4 p prime over 2 pi to the 4. So that's, that's one step that I skipped. This d by d a squared brings down a minus d prime squared. So this is one half integral e to the i p. Oh, I left out the d fourth. d fourth x. e to the i p x by tilde of p d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. Uh, p squared plus m squared uh, e to the i p prime x by tilde of p prime d fourth p prime p pi to the fourth p fourth x. Okay, so we're down at this stage. Now, um, Dirac really, really is our friend. Um, he introduced many things and they help us out a great deal. One of the things is this delta function. d to the fourth x over 2 pi to the fourth, let me just write it down, integral e to the i x p plus p prime p fourth x, and let me divide by 2 pi to the fourth, this is equal to delta fourth, often one leaves that out, of p plus p prime. So, so this thing is equal to a half integral delta of p plus p prime by tilde of p by tilde of p prime, p squared plus m squared, or is it p prime squared? Yeah, this hits that, this is a p prime squared. Uh, let us just say d fourth p, d fourth p prime, two pi to the fourth. I use up one two pi to the fourth to make the delta function. Okay. Now, as I said, um, Dirac is our friend because when we integrate over p fourth p prime, the delta function just says p prime is minus p, and so this is one half integral phi tilde of p phi tilde of minus p p well minus p squared, but because it's squared, we don't need to keep track of it d4 p over 2 pi to 4. Okay. On the other hand, we saw over here that because the field C is real, phi tilde of minus p is just phi star of p. So this thing is absolute value of phi of p squared, all of this. So I've derived the top line filling in all these steps, and I, I think it was, I think it's good to fill in the steps. But you can appreciate that checking all that wouldn't have been fun. So I, so the stuff, so I'm skipping that in the stuff that's going to be online. All right. Any questions? All right, now let me come over here. By the way, 
I think that I'm going to try to do the following. Um, sort of in the middle of the lecture, these lectures are an hour and 15 minutes, so sort of in the middle of the lecture, when you all are a little bit tired, ask me to tell you a story. Okay? And um, uh, I'll try to do that. I had, just a moment ago, I had one in mind, now I've forgotten it, but if you ask me, I will remember one of those stories. But, all right, so um, we found out what S0 of B is, and now we had, we have a formula here for these various mean values in the vacuum of time ordered products. And so we can define something amusing. Z0 of J. Now J is an external current. And so we're going to call this time ordered product of E to the integral J of X, B of X, P fourth X. So this is Euclidean time order. Sorry, what's this? You must have said it. What are we doing right now? What? What did you say we were doing? What, what are we this? doing? What is this? We're, we're, we're going to compute something called Z0 of J, right. which I'm defining this way. Okay. It's very close to what uh, Z, it's something that Z considers. But, oh, all right. Z did it in, um, in uh, Minkowski space rather than Euclidean space, and it's easier in Euclidean space. But it's, it's similar. In the notes that are online for chapter 16 of my uh, book, um, I do it in, the, in, the, in Minkowski space. But you'll see there are some extra steps in Minkowski space. And so it's, in fact, easier to do it in clearer in the space. But you, yeah. So is J an arbitrary function of X? Yes. It's the J, it's a function of X, and Z0 is a functional of that function of X. Ready? Why would you do it in one space or the other? I mean, like... Well, you have to do it in both. in both. I mean, you need to understand how it goes in both, but I want to do it in Euclidean space first because it's clearer and simpler. Okay, so why didn't you do it in both, like, I guess, in your book or something like that? Why didn't I do both in the book? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I was tired. Maybe I was stupid. I, <laughs> I, I did it in the Minkowski space. All right. Well, we using that formula over there, we see that this thing is an integral e to the integral j p d of x e to the minus s0 of phi, oops, there's a typo here, d phi divided by e to the minus s0 of phi d phi. Does somebody have a pen, an extra pen? No, it's not extra, but it's not extra. Yeah. Let me use it. It's extra now. Oops. <laughs> Thanks. Where S0 is the thing under the clock over there. Okay, now, what is Z0 of the zero function? So wouldn't it just be like one? Yes. You like a choke. Okay, so Z0 of 0 is 1. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to absorb the J phi into this. And so that means I'm going to define S0 of phi and J as S0 of phi 
minus the integral of jp d fourth x. There's an unhappy minus sign here. You see this minus sign is here. And so since this thing comes in with a plus, I have to put another minus sign here. And now, of course, I'm going to define a Fourier transform. J tilde of P is integral to e to the minus i Px, J of x, P fourth x. Analogously to that. And then this modified action What is it? Well, it's going to be one half integral phi tilde of t absolute value squared times p squared plus m squared. Well, that part is the part we already calculated. And let me put a big bracket here. And then minus j tilde star of p phi tilde of p minus phi star tilde of p j tilde of p d fourth p over two pi to the fourth. Now, should I? I skipped a couple of steps here in which I turned minus the space integral of j phi into minus these two. Should I, should I do, should I put in the steps? Anybody want me to put, should I put them in? Yes, no? No, okay, all right. Okay, so this is what you get. I hope. And um, so now one can change variables. And so I'm going to change variables to psi tilde of p equal to phi tilde of p plus j of p divided by p squared plus m squared. Now what happens when we do that? Well then, S0 of P and J is going to be 1. I'm going to put in a couple of steps here. Integral, so it's going to be phi tilde of, it's not supposed to be a prime here, phi tilde of P star plus J tilde star of P squared plus m squared times phi tilde of p plus j tilde of p over p squared plus m squared. So that's this term, but it's times p squared plus m squared. And then we have minus j tilde star of t. Oh, wait a minute. I screwed up. This is a minus. This is a sign. And this is a minus. So I'm writing, if, if psi is phi tilde plus j tilde, then phi is psi tilde minus j goes like this. And then this one is going to be psi tilde of p minus j tilde of p
Notice my left hand is down. That means you need to worry about mistakes. And uh, what's the end of this? Well, we have a big curly bracket, say. And the end of it is d fourth p minus four. Is this thing. Okay. Now, with luck, I haven't screwed up the minus signs. I'm starting to worry. It should be all right, but um, all right. So first of all, do we want to make sure that the J side terms cancel? So we've got here J star psi with a minus sign. Oh Lord, I've got it. Um, these were my original notes done by hand. All right, we're going to have to. So we should do this cooperatively. There's a minus sign loose somewhere. First of all, this comes in with a plus sign. So. Because of this minus sign, we stuck this in with a minus sign here. Then, in the steps I skipped, this J psi should come in with minus signs here. Okay. Now, maybe maybe there should have been a minus sign here. Which is it was bottom there. part is right. You think it's you think it's okay? Well, what, I mean, which part do you think is right? The bottom part or the what I what I what I want is to use the correct sign so that the terms that are psi j all cancel. And the way I put it in this way was I shouldn't should have had all these parentheses p. By the way, th this is something that you need to know. You need to be economical in notation. When you put in too many, when you make the notation too explicit, the brain gets confused. It's just too much in the vis visual field. So this is psi tilde minus j tilde over p squared plus m squared. I think that's a clear way of writing it. And And now the problem is that we've got a minus sign here, so this is minus that, and here it's also minus. So I think I should have done it the other way around. Minus, plus, 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 plus. Right. Now it works. Because now J star psi comes in with a plus sign here and a minus sign there. On the other hand, psi star J comes in with a plus sign, and over here, psi star J has a minus sign. And notice that the denominators in both cases cancel because it's a p squared plus m squared here. So this is the right way to do it. So let me see your thing here. So it's um, thank you. All right, now let's go over here. Well, I shouldn't erase that. Much of this stuff cancels. All right. 
So what's left? Those things cancel. And so S0 of phi and J is this term, which doesn't cancel. F to the value squared times P squared plus M squared. These guys cancel when they multiply the size, and then what's left? You get a plus term of J squared with one factor of P squared plus M squared in the numerator, two of the denominator, so it's absolute value of J of P squared tilde over P squared plus M squared, but then we have two factors of so the minus sign, and so this is equal to minus um, j tilde p absolute value squared over p squared plus m squared. in to our expression here. Well, what does it look like? It's saying that Z0 of J, in fact, let me rewrite this. This is now S0 of psi. psi, that's this term, and then minus a half integral j tilde of p absolute value squared over p squared plus m squared p fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. So now what we have then is that c0 of j so I'm filling in a couple of steps that were skipped in these notes. It's going to be this term doesn't involve the path integral, you see. There's no field phi here. So this is, but it comes in with a minus sign. So this comes in with a plus. So it's e to the one half integral j tilde of p f to value squared fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth p squared plus m squared and then what's left? Well, it's e to the minus s0 of psi still a path integral d phi divided by e to the minus s0 of phi d phi But now, the difference between phi and psi is just a constant. Or let us say this is in momentum space. If you Fourier transform the difference in um, position space is, again, it's just a constant. Psi, psi of x is phi of x plus uh, something involving j, some integral of j. So that means that d phi is equal to d psi. And so this is equal to e to the one half integral j tilde of p squared d for p over 2 pi to the fourth divided by p squared plus m squared times integral e to the minus s0 of psi d psi divided by e to the minus s0 of phi d phi. Yes? Should the bottom 
the denominator and the other equation. Let me S0 of the sign. No, I didn't bother to do anything to this integral. I'm just screwing around up here. Uh, all right. No? Okay, well, what do you think this ratio is? gives us an answer. Z0 of J has this very nice form. Notice this is consistent with our earlier result that Z0 of 0 is 1. Because if you set J equal to 0, you get E to the 0, which is 1. Right. Now, we can rewrite this um, this expression in various ways. So why? How do you know that they're the same people? I might have just missed that. How do we know that that ratio was one? Yeah. Well, because it was. I re oh I replaced d phi with d psi because. Phi and psi differ just by something that's independent of path integration, something involving J. And then this is just, I mean, the difference of phi and psi are just dummy variables, so they don't care what we call them. And we could then change this back to phi and cancel. Oh, I, sorry, I didn't I forgot to give you one. Ready? Let me apologize in advance to any of you I did for the show. I'm just saying. But I'm throwing them to somebody in the back. This is a P. Yes. All right, now there's, there's some cute things we can do with this. In particular, we can go back to position space. So let me go, let me take us back to position space. And again, I just did that instantaneously in the notes that I'm going to put online uh, this evening, but I think I should fill in the steps. So, we have J0 of Z is, or Z0, I should say, of J is e to the one-half integral j of b after y squared p squared plus m squared p fourth p over 2 prime of b. All right. Now, what's j tilde? Well, unfortunately, I've erased it there. But j tilde of p So this is, I want to just write it as exp, one half integral, one over p squared plus m squared, p fourth p over two pi to the fourth. Okay, now the rest of this is integral e to the minus, minus px, ipx, sorry. J of x, e of x, integral e to the minus i um, first of all it's star, so this is going to be a plus i. Uh, P is the same. Uh, x prime, j of x prime, e of x prime. So that's what it is literally in detail. Once again, Dirac comes to the rescue, and we have an integral d4 
Oh, let's see. I can't do the D4P. Um, wait, wait, no. Um, wait a minute. I, I think I screwed up somehow. J hat. Yeah, this is a total of Um Oh, sorry. I, I'm, 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 I'm expecting this thing to simplify. It does not simplify. I'm going to rewrite this as hello. <laughs> I'm going to rewrite this as <laughs> one half integral j of x, j of x prime, d4 of x, d4 of x prime, and all the rest of this I'm going to call delta of x minus x prime. What is delta? Delta of x minus x prime is the integral fourth b over 2 times fourth uh, e to the i p well I've got actually a minus for some reason so x minus x prime over p squared plus m squared notice because of the minus sign here this is a function of x minus x prime Notice, however, that because P is even, you can have a plus or minus here. This is the Euclidean version Feynman propagator. The hardest part of that is spelling Euclidean and propagator, and I hope I got them right, but many of them are just short. Alright. The ordinary Feynman propagator has a Minkowski metric on P squared and an I epsilon plus or minus i epsilon of the number. All right. I think this is a place to stop for a minute and tell you the story. Right, now, which story? Um, the story went through my head a moment ago. Um, sorry, we were talking about Dirac. I've been talking about Dirac now. We contributed so much to physics. Um, among the things that he contributed, of course, was this idea of a cat. And, well, the cat idea was kind of there, but what he did was he introduced the bra. So then you could have outer products like this. And that was new in notation. It's extremely useful. Because, for example, if you have a complete set of states, the identity operator is the sum. So you couldn't, uh, people couldn't write this down until Dirac brought in the, the bra. And the way he thought of it as bra is if this is a bra, then this is bra some operator C and then the cat, and so this spells bracket. He was very clever. All right, um, so the story is I was once at a party in Louisiana years and years ago, probably before most of you were born, and um, Wigner was there and so was Dirac, and that's partly because one of them married the other's sister. And I think it's the Dirac married Wigner or Wigner's sister. She was also there. Anyway, um, so Dirac and Wigner were sitting on the couch. And I was 
about as far from them as I am from those of you in the second and third row. And this was shortly after Mandelstam and Berkeley had shown that certain supersymmetric gauge theories didn't have any ultraviolet infinities. And I knew that Dirac had taken the position, which I really agree with, that renormalization is fine, but in fact, we shouldn't have the infinities in theory at all. And so I asked Dirac, what do you think of Mandelstam's results about N equals four supersymmetric and Mills theory being ultraviolet finite? And he and Wigner just sat there on the couch, and I waited and waited and waited. He never said anything. And so I, I just went on with whatever I, else I was doing at the party. And um, subsequently, I wrote, read a book about a biography of Dirac's last year. And it turns out that he would frequently do that. People would ask him a question, and he very often would simply not respond. <laughs> um, he, he believed in not speaking unless he had something useful to say. Or maybe he answered the question implicitly by saying that he hadn't thought about Mandelstam's paper. Um, uh, and so no response was equivalent to not having a thought about it. I don't know. But, um, he once, well, he, one of his hobbies was gardening, especially gardening roses. And that's one reason why when he retired from Cambridge, after a stop at the University of New York, he moved to Florida State University in Tallahassee because of the, the climate's perfect for roses. Anyway, when he was in England, um, I guess it was, I don't know if it was before or after the Second World War, but some German professor came to visit him to ask him some questions. And Dirac was there tending his roses on his knees and I guess weeding the roses. And the German professor said, is Professor Dirac at home? And Dirac said, no. The German professor went back to Germany. Um, that at least is the version of the story that I've heard. Um, oh, there's another story. This this one's actually more fun. Um, Dirac's wife once said to him, "What would you do if I left you?" And he said, "I'd say goodbye, dear." <laughs> Okay, end of stories. Let's now apply this thing. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so let's see what the meaning of this is. I'm going to now make contact with a very nice observation that Z made, but in the context of Minkowski history. And I think it's a little bit simpler here. Let's let J of X be delta of X minus X1 plus delta of X minus X2. So we're saying basically that there are two points in which this, in which the current is excited. And um, I'm gonna, we're gonna think of these as the field being basically at two places. So in other words, the the uh, we're doing z zero z zero of j then is how are we thinking of it um, vacuum time order product um, e to the uh, basically phi of x one plus phi of x two it's effectively that, isn't it? Uh, times time, because we have also the integral d4 
uh, T. So this is essentially what we're computing. All right. Now, what is this? Question. What is that symbol for the E? You know, after the. Product. This is just a T, time ordered product. Okay, so first, the first thing we have to do, since we're in momentum space, and we're going to stick that, we're going to deal with that, uh, we have to see what J tilde of P is. So J tilde of P is E to the minus I P X, delta of X minus X1 plus delta of X minus X2, and it is D4 X, and so, once again, Dirac is our friend, and this is uh, e to the minus i p x1 uh, plus e to the minus i p x2, p dot x2. But these are space things. Um, what about the time integral? Well, there's no time dependence here. You see, this is time independent. And so this integral is e to the minus i p zero t. Well, that's just two pi delta of p zero. So j tilde of p is two pi delta of p zero times these two phase factors, the sum of these two phase factors. Now we're going to take this and stick it in there and do that integral. Am I going too fast up here? Did I skip something? Delta of say p zero is an integral e to the minus i p zero. Let us just say t dt over two pi. And here we just had a dt, so that's two pi delta of p zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One dx zero. Short doesn't work in this room. So. <laughs> um, that all right? I'm not going to write it down again. It's under the clock. Um, it's since since J tilde has two terms in it, is the sum of two phase factors times the delta function. There are going to be four terms. There's going to be a one one, a two two, a one two, and a two one. All right. Now a one one and a two two are um, sort of self interaction. And so we're going to focus our attention on the 1, 2, and the 2, 1. And in fact, the 1, 2, and the 2, 1 are going to turn out to be equivalent. So let's just look at the 1, 2 term. The 1, 2 term is a half integral 2 pi delta of p0 squared e to the minus i p dot x1 minus x2 p squared plus m squared p4 
fourth D over two pi to the fourth. By the way, you should be reading the book by Z. So as I said, Z gives you his viewpoint, and then I'm giving you something that's more sort of the nitty gritty. Okay, so we have a d fourth p integration here. This delta function forces uh, p zero to be zero. And so what is this? It's one half delta of zero integral of two pi cancels one of those. The dp zero is gone. And what we have is e to the minus i p dot x1 minus x2 dq p 2 pi q p0 is 0, p vector squared plus m squared. All right? Is, is everybody happy with this or did I skip something? Ah, oh, I left out a 2 pi. Okay. Now, remember, remember over there, 2 pi delta of 0, Just let's just use the formula in the lower right corner of that board beneath the clock. Let's set p0 equal to 0. So that means delta of 0 is an integral dx0 over 2 pi. So that means it's all the time divided by 2 pi. So that means effectively 2 pi delta of x0, delta of 0 is t. Okay. So this thing is t over 2. Divided by 2 pi. Okay, sorry, I just missed that. 
Now, okay, so what do we have? What we've got is that uh, this thing, Z0 of J, is equal to, oh, dude, what's the story? You guys want some elucidation on this? Yes. Yes. Yes? Okay. All right. Now, I don't have notes on it, but I think I can wing it. It's actually in the book somewhere. This is an important integral because it's the integral that gives you the Yukawa potential. You see, that thing I wrote down is the Yukawa potential. And this was an insight of the Japanese physicist Yukawa had way back in the 20s, I don't know. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's let x1 minus x2 just be the vector r. So we have e to the minus i p dot r dqp 2 pi cubed p squared plus m squared. Okay, that's our integral. All right, now let's pick a coordinate system in which um, pz is, in, is parallel to r, and so this is an integral e to the minus i pr lengths cosine theta. The d phi integration on dqp gives us a 2 pi. We then have the angular integration, which is d cosine theta. And then we have the dr integration. The d cosine beta is minus 1 to 1, dr is 0 to infinity. Whoops, it's dp, not dr. Is this OK? All right, the two pi's cancel. Give this a 2 pi squared. Uh, the d cosine theta just gives us minus i pr e to the minus i pr minus e to the i pr. by means of a contour integration, we can rewrite this as an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, e to the i p r over i p r, p squared plus m squared, dp over 2 pi squared, right? Um, hold on, I screwed up. This is p squared dp. So this is p dp. And there may be other mistakes, so let's try to do this. However, um, what we can do is we can add a ghost contour in the upper half plane. Because in the upper half plane, how do we change the minus integration from zero to infinity? Right, it was zero to infinity, but I had two terms here with a minus sign. But when you flip p from p to minus p, that introduces a minus sign. Oh, so I, just it. I think it all 
things together. Okay, so what is this? Let me first get some of this stuff out in front. 1 over 4 pi squared. Actually, 1 over 2 pi i, 2 pi r. So let me write it that way. Now it really looks like a contour integration. E to the i, p r, p over p squared plus m squared dp. Alright, now I'm turning this into a contour integration because in the upper half plane, if p is has a positive imaginary part, then this thing is exponentially damped, r being positive. Um, and at, at, at infinity, it goes as 1 over p at the two ends. So uh, my integration looks like this. This thing has a pole at i m. When p is equal to i m, there's a pole there. And um, consequently, by uh, what? The theorem of Cauchy or Cauchy? Cauchy's worth the theorem of Cauchy. Have you ever heard of Cauchy? Cauchy's worth the theorem of Cauchy. Oh, I hate residues. <laughs> the Cauchy integral theorem and integral formula, I mean, they do everything for you. Why does anybody ever need to introduce this concept of residue? I think it's, I think it's, um, stupid. <laughs> um, okay, so let's uh, see what this is. In other words, let me rewrite it as 1 over 2 pi r. 1 over 2 pi i integral e to the i p r p d p over p minus i m p plus i m and um, so this is the pole and so we get the answer is just this so it's 1 over 2 pi r uh, e to the i r p is equal to i m and then this is 2im. So that's it. And why is there an extra i? I've got an extra i. In other words, I've got here what I wanted, which was e to the minus mr. over 4 pi r and I have an extra i m. I don't find the m, but I don't like the i. Yeah. So there is another 2 pi i and you have p over there, so if you put uh, in p that, that number, the i you cancel out. I mean, so one thing is equal to yeah, 2 pi i times the residue, and residue you have uh, a key uh, p over there, then it's a problem. It's pdp. pdp. Ah, thank you. There's an extra i, p is equal to i m here, so they cancel. Great. Thank you. You 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 get one one or two. You're entitled to. What well, was the cooperative thing? I'd say he found it. Huh? He found it. I just was saying what he was saying. Woo! <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's uh, the answer. Now let's now let's wrap this up so as to figure out to see that this thing is attractive. Well, what is the Z0? Z0 of j is basically e to the minus t e sub j. 
and we're seeing that we computed it. There's a one half, but remember there's the one two and the two one, so the one half cancels. And this is e to the t, e to the minus mr over four pi r. So that means that e one two or e one two plus e two one. Let us just say e sub j is minus e to the minus mr over 4 pi r. So that's an attractive Yukawa interaction. So the interaction of two scalar particles is intrinsically attractive, and that's what um, Yukawa had in mind. He thought that the nuclear force was due to uh, a scalar field, um, and that that's why uh, nucleons attracted to each other. Well, there's some truth to it in that the, uh, there is a scalar or a pseudo-scalar particle called the pi meson, and um, it is uh, exchanged by nucleons effectively. And um, this is all kind of murky, actually. I, I should say that the strong interactions themselves are very murky, even in, in physics today, because we think of it as in fact, the theory of quarks and gluons, but we can't figure out in any, any simple way uh, how to um, think of um, why it is that these gluons and quarks are confined. I mean, there's, there are lattice simulations that are consistent with that, but we don't have simple, uh, simple theoretical explanations. Um, and uh, to some extent, the, the, another way of looking at the theory of quarks and gluons is to think of a theory of nucleons and pions and so forth. And that's what um, uh, loses uh, power was doing. All right, so we're at the end of the hour. I guess you could turn it off. Unless there's a question.